Hello my fellow chatterers and book lovers and anyone else who's popped in because you're curious about what this is or you have got a bit lost. I'm Chatty, this is my channel Chatty the Mad Chatter and I'm going to be chatting very madly about my May book stats. Yes it is practically the end of July but that's fine. This is sort of like the first video that I've done for a while. I can't remember when I left. I did like a batch few and then haven't done any for a while. So I am going to be doing another kind of life under the hat update general chit chat video. Um, but I wanted to kind of get some of my staples done because I've had books sat here from May and I've not put any June or July books up here because I haven't wanted to move the May ones out the way until I filmed this video and I just haven't found the right moment sorry had to go and uh, deal with something but yes I've not felt able to film whether that's physically with time or just mentally with energy but I am so excited to actually get these books off my shelves and kind of wrap up my May so I can mentally move on to June and July because I love just having this video diary of my reading journey and being able to share the books with you. So I'm going to have a little bit of tea so I suggest you join in and grab yourself a be beverage of some description and then we're going to get into um, my May stats. So here we go everyone, it is one shot, there is no editing, clink, 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 clink. There we go, tiny teacup gimmick done. I could not remember, because it has been so long ago, what I had on my TBR for May, so I had to re-watch my video. So the first book that I had from my TBR game was The Daughter of the Moon Goddess by Su Lin Tan. Um, so I got this one from doing a series spin and this was a new series I'm starting, this is the first in a duology. The second book that I got from doing my book game was The Secrets of Haven Point. Um, I did a roll away where I picked six prompt cards and I got the one I didn't want which was to find an author's name and this one was the author or book title beginning with the letter and I picked out A. But it just so happened this book, The Secrets of Haven Point, is by Lizette Orton. So that worked perfectly and I was delighted to get this on my list. The third book that I got was um, from doing my goal dart where I shot a Nerf gun at different goals that I want to be um, hitting over the years. And I got a non-fiction and for that I got Break the Mould um, by Sinead Burke. And then I got another series spin and I did City of, I got City of Brass, again starting a series and this is by S.A. Chakraborty. It is the first in the Devabad trilogy. So, out of those four books that were on my TBR, there's no reward and punishment, it's just fun, it's just to help me choose some of my possibilities. 50%. <laughs> I did read Daughter of the Moon Goddess and I did read The Secrets of Haven Point which means City of Brass and Break the Mould have gone back onto the shelf to be read at a later date. But the other books that I have to put into my May, um, what I read in May, I haven't got a collective word for it, um, are um, Kidi by Elle McNichol. Um, the next one, I just have a bit of paper because it was an audio book um, and that is Viva Durant and the Secret of the Silver Buttons. Um, which is by Ashley Finn Armand and was narrated by Badney Turpin. I then had the Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Medieval England by Brandon Sanderson. A Tempest of Tea by Has Hasper Faisal. And finally, but definitely not the least, I have this massive hard petition of Oathbringer by Brandon Sanderson. So there we go, that is seven books that I read in May and little Eeyore is just jumping off the shelf. Eeyore, go sit back. There you go, you can sit there. Obviously wanted his moment of fame. So I'm going to chat a little bit about um, the Spoonies Readathon that I took part in. Um, if you are not sure what the Spoonies Readathon is, it is a readathon that ran throughout the month of May promoting books 
um, either by authors with a disability or um, featuring characters um, who are part of the disabled community. Um, and this was run um, and the brainchild of Emily from No Born Novels and um, the co-host was um, Kat from Bruise and Reviews. I will link both their channels and their announcement video so you can have a look at their stuff. Even though it's a few months ago, I still think it's nice to kind of, if you're like, oh, that sounds awesome, maybe you'll want to join in next year. So you might want to look at the video to get the vibe of if you need to kind of do a little mental note, little calendar thing as to um, what it is. Um, I also wanted to make sure that I did read um, books by Asian authors as well because it is the Asian readathon. I didn't fully take part in it like I have done at other years, making sure I hit prompts, but I definitely did the main prompt, which is read a book by an Asian author. So I did do the bare minimum, which is what um, Cindy from Read With Cindy recommends, um, but trying not to go too crazy because can you see Oathbringer? Oathbringer, the massive Oathbringer is on, is on that shelf there that I read. So that would not have happened if I was focusing too much on the readathons instead of books I want to read this year, which is Oathbringer. Hooray, it's a huge achievement. I'm so thrilled with myself. Oathbringer was a big one that I needed to read this year. So yay, yay. I'm gonna drink my tea in excitement now. It's just regular tea, just good old PG tips, but it is a really nice temperature and it is very yummy. Um, for those who have not got the eyeballs working at the moment, this is um, being drunk out of a mug that is covered in books, some titles you may recognise. Um, we have uh, Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer, Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar, um, Sue Townsend, The Lost Diaries of Adrian Mole, Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, The Tiger Who Came to Tea, which I'm thrilled there's a picture book on here. Um, Lord of the Rings by J.R. Tolkien, The Story of Oz, no, no, not The Story of Oz, I always say that, The Story of O by Pauline Re Rose, Rue. I don't, I've, I've not read that one, there's, there's many books on here, there's quite a few, not that many that I've actually read, but it's a very cool mug that was given to me by my friend. Anyway, we have gone on many tangents, waffle is galore, I'm going to move on to talking about the Spoonies readathon. So, um, there are two books I did not manage to get read this month. I've already spoken about one of them. Um, that was Break the Mould by Sinead Burke. Um, and that was for prompt number three, which was to read a non-fiction book about disability. I did not read that. Um, I felt quite burnt out by reading a lot of non-fiction in April and I still felt burnt out throughout May. And I still got books that I was continuing to read that were non-fiction. And it just felt too much <laughs> so it wasn't its time but i will read that at some point and um, the other book that i did not get finished for may which i really could have done if i had not been obsessively trying to read oathbringer um and that was um oh where's it gone hold on yes the other book that i didn't finish which was for prompt six to read a book um by a bipoc author or from a non-western country I had Koku Akanabi um, and the Heart of Midnight, which is by Maria Monterenreo Adebisi. And she is a black author and most of this book is set in um, Nigeria. So I was very keen to read this one. I read some of it during May, but not all of it. So I can't count it for May. So... <laughs> The ones I did read that count for the Spoonies Readathon are uh, The Secrets of Haven Point and Kidi. Um, both of these are by authors who have a disability. Um, and so they both fit prompt number one, which is to read a book by an author with a disability. Uh, prompt number two was to read a book um, featuring a character with an invisible disability. Um, for that, Kidi fitted the bill beautifully um, because Kidi, blah, blah, Kidi is autistic, um, so obviously you cannot physically see that, um, so that counted as an invisible disability. Um, and then for the following prompts, <laughs> uh, the secrets of Haven Point uh, lapped them all up. Um, so that is prompt number four, um, a book that features disability that is not a contemporary book, and this book is a fantasy and has a whole host of um, main characters and side characters with disabilities because this is 
um, a community um, where people who have disabilities feel that they uh, are the mainstream society is a scary place so they have their own little safe commune this haven as it were um at haven's point and um, prompt number five is to um read a book featuring a disability that affects one of the five senses um so our main character alpha i knew it begins with a i can never remember her name i really should um alpha looks um she is a she um, has burns on her face and this also affected one of her eyes and her ears. So she has um, visual and hearing impairment um, as well as I can't quite remember how it is described, but it's also affected her foot as well. So she does sort of like, um, she, she has a little bit of a limp. Um, and then her best friend is Badger. Um, Badger is blind. Um, so that definitely affects the sight senses. So um, that one was definitely covered with this book. And then finally, uh, featuring a book with a visible disability, and I have just described our protagonist, Alpha, who definitely has um, physical disabilities. Um, there are also invis invisible disabilities in here. The captain of the lighthouse um, has agoraphobia, um, and there are lots, a whole variety of other um, disabilities featured in this book as well. Um, it was a brilliant, this was also the group read, and it was a brilliant read. So there we go. That is my speedy to read some books. Um, hopefully next year I will expand on it a bit more. I won't be um, needing to read a massive, epic, biggest book I own fantasy. So I'll have a little bit more leeway with branching out and having some adult books with good disability representation in them as well. So I forgot to mention books for the Asian Readathon. So like I said, I wasn't looking at the prompts. I can't even remember what the prompts were. Um, but two books by Asian authors that I have are A Tempest of Tea. Um, so Hafsa Faisal, um, her parents are from Sri Lanka and they also have um, Middle Eastern and African heritage in the family. And um, this book, A Tempest of Tea, definitely draws from um sort of historical um the colonialization of sri lanka and also india and some of that is kind of brought into this book but it is a fantasy world um with fantastical characters um but it does um have a lot of different representation in here um daughter of the moon goddess by sulin tan um sulin tan was born in malaysia and has now settled in hong kong um and this is a retelling of a chinese um folk tale so there we go we have two very different oh there we go sorry book cover was the wrong way around <laughs> uh two very different um heritages explored in these books um and i really enjoyed both these fantasies okay now we're moving on to the stats and for that i am going to need my helpful little notebook because i cannot remember all of this in my brain which is why i write it down Okay, so first of all, looking at the age range of the books. Um, I was not sure, <laughs> out of the two books I've just spoken about, um, Daughter of the Moon Goddess and The Temper of T Tempest of Tea, if they were adult or YA fantasy. I don't have strong feelings either way. I feel they can quite happily fit in either category i don't feel there's anything particularly in there that i wouldn't say i'd say high-end ya i wouldn't recommend either film for 12 year olds um but i'd say you know 16 17 18 would get on really well with the stories but equally i think adults will um it's kind of more i don't know what the word is they're very different like you've got one which is the um retelling of a legend and one which is more of a heist story and um, both the complete fantastical worlds um and they have sort of a range of different characters and um, neither of them are epic fantasy in that they're not covering a whole plethora of points of view um you have two different viewpoints in a tempest of tea and you have just the one viewpoint in daughter of the moon goddess but according to story graph daughter of the moon goddess is adult and a tempest of tea is ya so i just read one ya book which was the tempest of tea um Three Middle Grade, which is um, the audiobook um, Viva de Mont and the Mystery of the Silver Buttons, uh, The Secrets of Haven Point and Kidi. And then the other three are adult books, which is Daughter of the Moon Goddess, Frugal Wizard's Guide to Surviving Medieval England, and Oathbringer. 
Um, and my next stat is um, what type of books are they in terms of are they physical, are they ebooks, all of that jazz. And quite simply, as you can see, we have six, if you can see, you have six physical books here in front of me. So six of them are physical and one I do not have because it is an audio book. So it was one audio book and six physical books. Um, from the library, I have zero books this month. Um, one book I'm counting is borrowed because the audio book Viva Durant Dumont and the Mystery of the Silver Buttons I got from Audible. So I had a uh, Audible like three months for like a pound <laughs> uh, offer. So I took that so I could read uh, finally hear the Andy Circus Lord of the Rings, which well, that's for June. Um, but whilst I was listening to that, there were times when I wanted something else to read. Um, and I felt like a middle grade and um, I looked at the free bucks Audible were offering and that was one of them. So kind of borrowed it from Audible, I suppose. Uh, and the other six books are my books. So all from my shelves in my own personal library. Um, I'm now going to talk about the sizes. So if you have not seen one of my stat videos before, um, I like to link my books to animal sizes because it makes sense in my brain. So an ant book is anything that is, I'm talking about the creepy crawly now, not the relative. Um, it is anything from um, below 150, no, from 150, I don't read anything below 150 pages, I'd have to have like a flea or something. It's from, an ant is between 150 and 300, no, I've done this wrong. Yes, no, bear with me. Right, so we're off to a great start because I've completely got my own categories wrong. Well done me. An ant is uh, 150 pages or below. Not had any of those this month. A mouse is 151 pages to 300 pages for which I have one and that is Kiddy. A goat is anything from 301 to 400 pages for which I have four books. So that is the audiobook Viva Dumont and the Mystery of the Silver Buttons. Um, the Secrets of Haven Point, um, the Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Medieval England, and A Tempest of Tea. It's very tricky trying to work out how long the audiobook was because it's only available on an audio. There is no physical copy of it and it just said four hours something. Um, but luckily I managed to work out from other books that I had and um, there was another book that was three hours something and that was 290 pages. So I was like, it fits a mouse. It's definitely a mouse. So four mouse sized books this month. No goat, not a mouse. <clears throat> four goat sized books this month. This is going so well. I have one cow sized book, which is um, Daughter of the Moon Goddess. A cow is something that is 401 pages to 500 pages. No elephants. An elephant is 501 to 700 pages. But I do have a dinosaur oh no blue whale 701 to 900 pages i have a dinosaur that is anything that is above 900 pages and oathbringer is definitely over 900 pages it's over a thousand pages it's a massive massive book so there we go that is all my books in their sizes on to genres uh quite simple this month five fantasy Oathbringer, Daughter of the Moon Goddess, Frugal Wizard's Guide, A Tempest of Tea, The Secrets of Haven Point. One mystery, that is Viva Dumont, and the mystery of the missing silver buttons. The clue is in the title. And one contemporary, which is Kiddy. Um, technically, Frugal Wizard's Handbook could be described as a sci fantasy, but let's just not talk about that book. Moving on to series. So series is a little interesting. Technically, I have started three series. Um, I have started Daughter of the Moon Goddess. I have started A Tempest of Tea. There are more books planned, not currently out yet. And I started um, the Viva Dumont series. There are three other books. However, as I access them from Audible, and I'm not planning to renew my Audible membership, and I have now, since it is July, got rid of it, I cannot access those books, so I will not be continuing with that series. That's not really a stat that I'm going to continue in terms of logging my series. Um, there is only one book out for A Tempest of Tea, so technically I'm up to date with one series because there's only one book. And I have made progress with the Stormlight Archive, um, Oathbringer being book three. 
technically Kidi is a, a prequel so that is part of the series but I didn't know that a kind of spark was getting a prequel till we noticed when everyone starts looking at what books are being released next year so I had like four months of knowing so I wasn't really anticipating and it's a prequel rather than a sequel so it kind of wasn't on my list of series that I'm mentally logging I was just so excited knew I was going to read it immediately so didn't really feel the need to log it but it's there series done <laughs> moving on to one of my goals which is I would like what I read each month half of my books to be global majority and half to be white Eurocentric because mainly the books I access, the books I have, the books that are um, highlighted and advertised more tend to be white Eurocentric books. So I'm trying to make a conscious effort to read more global majority because I want to have a wide variety of stories from different cultures um, showing a wide variety of different people um, and set in different places um, with people whose skin tone is not just white. However, it is a goal I am struggling with. Um, this month I read three books by um, authors um, who are global majority. That was um, Viva Dumont and the Mystery of Silver Buttons, Tempest of Tea and Daughter of the Moon Goddess, which means I had four books which are white Eurocentric. So that is close, but not quite. So if I had managed to crack on and read uh, Koku um, and Akanabi, then I would have achieved that goal, but I did not. So I did not achieve that goal. Um, I'm going to come on to more of that goal later. I'm going to park it now, but that's where I am at the moment. Um, it's improved on previous months, so I'm close. I'm nearly halfway, but it's not yet achievable. It's not yet been achieved. Um, so now I'm going to look on to are the books I'm reading diverse? So I've already, because I spoke about the Asian Readathon, I've already mentioned that two of my books um, were from Asian authors. Um, Viva Demont was from a, is um, written by a black author and um, the main characters and the family um, are black. Um, I have zero books that are written by Latinx authors or have Latinx characters and zero um, with indigenous authors or indigenous characters. So not doing so well on those kind of sides of the reading global majority books. Um, in terms of LGBTQ plus representation, one book. <laughs> so the way I class my, um, whether I think the books are showing good LGBTQ plus representation, um, it has to have the protagonist. So the protagonist has to be a member of the LGBTQ plus community and only one book has a protagonist because otherwise I think you can you would then be like well do I count this kind of side character but there you know you you have a single side character in Oathbringer which is a massive book then you've got other side characters that are more prominent but they're still side characters so I find it hard to judge so I'm just going with the protagonist so I'm being very strict if the protagonist is not LGBTQ plus the book doesn't count as hitting that kind of diversity quota. So I only have one and that is Kidi. Um, I will just give a special shout out to The Secrets of Haven Point. Um, although the protagonists are not shown as LGBTQ+, um, you know, they, they, are, um, they are younger and they're not really thinking about any kind of sexual orientation or any kind of like romantic side in here. That's not part of the story at all. Uh, so for all I know, they could be, but it's not written in the pages. However, as part of the community, there are adults um, that are part of the LGBTQ Q plus community um, in this book. And I think they are portrayed really beautifully. No big deal. It's just part of this world that they're, they're preparing um, and they just mention the characters and they mention different people. Um, and I think it's just it's just done very beautifully. I just really appreciate the representation in here. But it's not a protagonist, so it doesn't count for my stats. Moving on to disability, um, and I break this down further. So it's not just if I was just labeling kind of disability in terms of all disabilities and including kind of mental health and grief and trauma within that as invisible disabilities I would have three but because I'm breaking it down into the categories I want to kind of discuss it a little bit deeper and um, so in terms of physical disability um, we have the secrets of Haven Point that I've already mentioned because of the Spoonies Readathon and um, in terms of invisible disability um, I'm breaking that down further into characters who are neurodivergent and characters who are struggling with mental health 
Um, so in terms of characters that are neurodivergent, we would have Kiwi that I've already mentioned. Um, mental health, I haven't mentioned so much. So, Oathbringer. We have three characters in Oathbringers. There are many others. But the three, I'd, the, it, it's a massive epic fantasy. You get many viewpoints. Um, there are many side characters that kind of be, are pulled more to the forefront. Um, but within here, um, definitely the three main characters are all struggling with different mental health issues. Um, so we have depression and anxiety explored in here. We have trauma and different methods of dealing with that. Um, and you also have addiction being looked at in here, as well as things like anger management. There is so much mental health representation in this book and it is done so well. It is set in a society that's more kind of akin to the medieval days. Um, so they don't really have a lot of words to describe things like depression. But it's very clear as a reader what struggles these characters are going through and why. So you look at a lot of kind of um, post-traumatic stress disorder as well. Um, a lot of all these things are explored. Um, and I think it's just done so well, the way all of these things are pulled together. Um, it's really thoughtful. It's a real kind of exploration of character, different choices those characters could make. And it's not a quick and easy fix. They have to work a lot through their problems. And it's something that they have to manage themselves. There are definitely people that support them, but it has to come from them. And what is explored really well is, as well as being um, good choices, <laughs> uh, good choices for good mental health, there are also bad choices for mental health and kind of quick fixes and ways of trying to deal with things that people do and there's a certain you can understand why they've made those choices and I just think it's a really great exploration of difficulties when dealing with mental health when dealing with grief when dealing with trauma and different ways we as humans cope with things um so absolutely highlight the Stormlight Archive as one of the best representations of mental health in books and I mean that across genres Now we come to the part, oh, actually, no, I realised, as I was talking about Oathbringer, I realised I never spoke about which books were new reads and which were rereads. <laughs> Six books were new reads to me and one book was a reread, which was Oathbringer. It was not my first time reading Oathbringer, but I had an amazing time doing a reread of it. Um, that is important information because when I talk about my least favourite and my favourite books, I don't think it's fair to include rereads in this because I think you have a very different relationship with that book because you've already explored it once you've already got an affection for it you're already thinking warmly of those characters inside it and um you get something different when you read a book the second time so I don't think it's fair otherwise I'm just constantly going to be talking about favorite books as being rereads so I don't include rereads I only include <laughs> new reads in my least favorite and favorites so let's start off with the least favourite. If you've seen my um, Curiouser and Curiouser videos where I did my May wrap ups, you may know which book is going to be my least favourite. Also, if you saw my major freak up, you may have an inkling as to which book it's going to be. Uh, if you didn't um, see those, I will link them here um and a little bit further afterwards as well so should you wish to you can go and see what exactly my problems were with a book that is the frugal wizard's handbook for surviving medieval england which is an amazing title that they did not deliver on so sad times um brandon sanderson up until this point was an auto by author i'm now more apprehensive <laughs> Um, yeah, I didn't get on with this book at all, um, which is so bizarre because I, th I think especially having reread Oathbringer, so I, re I read Handbook first, then I needed a serious big gap in between me picking up Oathbringer because I felt slightly um, like it had been tainted by how bad this book was. <laughs> And when I started reading Oathbringer, there were certain moments where I felt I was reading it more critically rather than being immersed in it because I think I was still having like book flashbacks of terror from the, this book. Uh, but luckily I got over that and I got in the swing of it and 
you just cannot compare the two like the incredibly complex amazing characters that have been built up the plots the threads the wonder of that world compared to Fugal Wizard's Handbook and I have no idea what I was saying because <laughs> I got interrupted again um anyway um yeah this book didn't work for me it felt like it's nice that Sanderson had an idea that he wanted to write about that didn't need to be published. It did need to be published, didn't need to be this big. It could have been a lot smaller and I don't think the combining of the three different plots worked. It kind of pulls you out of the story. Um, I think I would have enjoyed this Yeah, the plot I would have personally enjoyed is just silly fun times in supposed medieval England where you're someone that's from the future. I would have just, well not the future, other dimension, but I would have just enjoyed that more <laughs> without amnesia, dimension politics, all of that jazz. It would have just been more fun with the whole wizard thing. Anyway, yeah, this is my least favourite book. Bye! <laughs> my favourite book, much more fun to talk about, but again, I can't choose one. I've got two because I found them both really emotionally impactful. I feel they're very important books that should be read by both children, hint, hint, what they could be, uh, and adults. And they are The Secrets of Haven Point and Kidi. I just found with Kidi, continued on from a uh, kind of spark, which I absolutely loved. I love Elle McNichol's writing. I love how she shows us what an autistic character is like, what it's like to see the world through their eyes, to share this moment with them, and just how amazing and very different both Kidi and Addie are. Um, so Addie's a protagonist from uh, Kind of Spark. Um, I enjoyed being with this family again. I just enjoyed the writing. I just enjoyed it so much. It's got so much heart and I really loved this book. Secrets of Haven Point was just a really beautiful story. Um, I loved the little commune that was set up. I loved the friendship. I loved the struggles. Very kind of relatable to middle grade children about the difficulties of friendship, the difficulties of when you open up to adults and when you don't. Um, all of those things I thought were explored really well. I really loved how the disabilities were shown and um, how disabled characters were just shown as matter of fact. Like it wasn't made a big deal of, it's just here we are, let's crack on. Like there's more to us than our disability. Um, the plot was really interesting. I thought it explored a lot of interesting themes. I loved the mermaids. I loved all of this so much. I got very emotional reading this. I really want there to be a sequel because I want to carry on with these characters. I want to see where things go from here. And I really hope that Lizette Autumn has those stories ticking away at the back of her mind and then suddenly she will produce another book for us. That would be amazing. But regardless, I just love this book. I'm very keen to read more from Lizette Autumn and read all of Elle McNichol's backlist. <laughs> and that is it. That is my May stats. I hope you enjoyed yourself. If you made it to the end, please give me a little May Blossom. <laughs> I need it. It's currently grey outside. It's supposed to be sunny. So that would be nice. Um, and if you want to tell me what you read in May, I'd love to hear regardless of it not being May. Um, but if you want to tell me a really great book that you read in July, please do that as well. And hopefully I will have some more videos coming and I will be uh, back in booktube community zone again. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye everyone and happy reading. So long I forgot what my outro was.